Вас приветствует команда образовательной онлайн платформы. Uh, on the online educational platform, I welcome you as the manager of this platform. This is the first meeting of the webinar series called Educational Environment Without Bullying, Educational Approaches, International Approaches to Preventing Harassment. And before we start, I suggest us to uh, meet each other. Please uh, write in the chat what institution, what country you represent, who, what is your background? Uh, let us make a general landscape of the participants of our webinar series and then our chat will be filled with your messages as as far as you're doing it i'm going to tell you about uh, the presenters and the platform sclad is an educational on an online platform for international dialogue of professionals in the field of education this is an ecosystem of projects that facilitates uh, teachers to be aware of international trends and innovations. We organize international study tours, conferences, workshops, intensive courses. We develop international cooperation. We cooperate with international experts and educational institutions in the countries of Europe, Asia, and Americas. We operate as informational and technical partners. Our online activities have been on, going on for the last three years. We have implemented 29 projects uh, over 29,000 uh, educational workers from over 30 countries of the world have been covered, and we welcome all the participants that worked on our platform and uh, who met our international speakers for many times. We are thankful to all th 300 international experts who have shared their practices in our platform, and we are always open for cooperation and new suggestions and ideas. Our webinar series is not an exception, the one you are attending today, and it is my great pleasure to pass the floor to the general partner and the initiator of our workshop series, the chairperson of the public foundation called International Academy of Sciences, Ecology, Engineering and Pedagogy, Mr. Talgata uh, Temuratov. The floor is yours. Distinguished colleagues, on behalf of the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the International Academy of Sciences of Ecology, Engineering and Pedagogy, please let me welcome all the participants of our webinar series. The relevance of the webinar series topic is due to the con contradiction between the scale of the spread of bullying among children and adolescents in educational institutions and children's groups and the insufficient teacher implementation of modern approaches to prevent bullying of children. This leads to an escalation of aggression and violence in the group and in the institution and academic underperformance, emotional and psychological challenges, and also significantly increases a suicide risk in adolescents. Bullying in schools deprives millions of children and teenagers of the fundamental right to education. According to UNICEF, 63% of Kazakhstani children have witnessed bullying. 44% have been victims of bullying and 24% have committed acts of violence and discrimination against other children at school. According to the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Kazakhstan, every third student is bullied and becomes a victim of harassment. In 2021 alone, 105 suicides were registered in the country. In this regard, studying best international practices of bullying prevention in the educational environment will contribute to the study of international standards and practices of countering bullying efficiently, understanding the nature and consequences of violence, as well as the mechanisms for responding to it and forming a teacher's personal strategy to create a safe and supportive learning environment. We wish everyone fruitful work and let's make the life of our children without bullying and violence together. Once again, I welcome all of you at our platform and uh, I wish for us today and the future days to come uh, our webinar series to be at the very top level. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Talgat, for your very important words. And indeed, the topic of bullying is uh, very relevant. On your screens, you can see just figures, but I suggest to make them live. Tomorrow, when you come into your class of 28 children, you should know that eight children have been subjected to violence. Four of them were beaten by peers. By closing our eyes to the problem, we will never find out whether Paul, who was beaten in the backyard uh, for being like Harry Potter because of his glasses, and maybe who could be excellent in his academic performance, or maybe... Eugene was not able to get uh, the protection of his father because uh, the father said, stop crying, be a man. After such responses, we, distinguished colleagues, are those who can prevent and stop. And we are very thankful to you, distinguished colleagues, uh, for not being the huge number of uh, teachers who make a mistake, believing that bullying will disappear because it is harmless. And uh, we should not pay attention to it. In the chat, I can see a huge number of your wishes and introductions. And colleagues, thank you very much for sharing your information about yourselves. And on your screens, you can see the profile of the participants of our workshop series. Distinguished moderators, thank you for calculating the figures, and we welcome the uh, psychologists, uh, teachers, teachers and uh, professors, associate professors of pedagogical universities, teachers of schools, students, master program students, uh, directors on a bringing of children, social pedagogues, teachers of preschool educations, managers of educational institutions. We especially welcome those of you who are the entire teams of your teaching staff to attend our workshop series. This is the way to establish a good enabling environment without bullying and preventing bullying. We have special words of thanks to the international experts from the United States of America, Canada, Ireland. By the way, we welcome and we know that among us we have Moni Amur, the director of Anti-Bullying Center of, of Trinity College from Ireland. Hello. From Spain, Australia, UK, Finland, uh, Brazil, Sweden, and Italy. They will dwell on the factors that will uh, explain vulnerability to bullying, and they will introduce practical measures and their initiatives to combat uh, harassment and bullying. During the workshop series, we will uh, have some practical approaches and resources uh, for the teachers to ensure safe psychological and physical environment at educational institutions. Colleagues, on the screen, you can see the schedule or agenda of our series. I am um, showing you the chatbot uh, link, and you can see that the week is going to be very hectic. We hope you'll be able to participate in our broadcast. So you will be asking questions, looking for technologies and means to prevent harassment and bullying at our educational environment. It is my great pleasure now to introduce you the first presenter of our workshop series, the head of the Office of the National Center to Prevent uh, Harassment called Passer, Madam Judy French. Good morning, Judy. We know that in Los Angeles, US, you have a very early mor morning. On your yeah. screens, colleagues, you can see the questions we are going to ask and review. And this, these are very interesting ones. We very much hope that you are going to have questions to Judy, to us, and to we together, after Judy French wraps up, we'll be able to have a fruitful discussion. Before I pass the floor to Judy, I would like to remind you that a few technical details. If you need interpretation into Russian, please click uh, the globe button at the bottom of Zoom and select Russian channel. 
if this is not a computer that you are using but a smartphone, then you will click three dots, then interpretation, and then Russian channel. Our interpreter today is Dennis, who is ready in the working, and the entire technical details have been made seamless for them between the interpreter and the presenter, Judy French. We urge you to ask questions in the chat. You can see the button called chat. You can write uh, questions and our technical moderators will pick them up and I will be happy asking them to Madam French. And also, if you have any technical hiccups, uh, if you, you do not hear the voice, uh, then please text in the chat and our technical moderators, Victoria and Anna, will surely help you address these issues and troubleshoot. So once again, I'm introducing you the in director of the Los Angeles office, uh, Madam, or the office uh, of the National Center to Prevent Harassment uh, from the Los Angeles office, Madam Judy French. Judy, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from Los Angeles. Beautiful day here. Uh, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. And it's an honor to be here and addressing all of you. Uh, I'm particularly enthusiastic about speaking to groups of educators uh, and adults, be they parents, caregivers, educators, administrators, because the research is very clear on the point that Kids think, because we all adults say something different about bullying, whether it's advice before bullying happens or advice when bullying happens, we all say something different using different terms, uh, giving advice sometimes that doesn't work. So kids are thinking, perhaps adults really don't know what they're talking about when it comes to bullying. So it's very, very important and something that really energizes me for us to all be on the same page with our definitions, our terminology, so that we can provide a united front when we're speaking to youth, but also when we're speaking to other adults about bullying. Very important that we all begin to unify our thoughts around bullying. Uh, so very excited to be here today. I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna get started. Give me just a second. And all right. It's okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I am Judy French. I am an educator. I work for uh, PACERS National Bullying Prevention Center. I run the Los Angeles office, but I go all over uh, doing outreach and presentations uh, for the National Bullying Prevention Center. I want to give you a little bit of history about who we are because our core values influence all the work we do for bullying prevention. So PACER, the parent nonprofit, was founded in the late 70s to help parents of children with disabilities navigate our public school system. Some of you know that in the late 70s, we enacted laws in the United States uh, to ensure a fair and appropriate education for all children. And so what that meant for children with disabilities is that they then were able to receive accommodations and assistance that would help customize their education for them. But parents didn't know how to avail themselves of those, those uh, rights. And so we began helping uh, families with children with disabilities because of that work we were doing bullying prevention work all along uh, because in our country, children with disabilities are bullied at a rate of two to three times their peers without disabilities. And so we've been doing bullying prevention work in one form or another uh, since 1977. Now, we became intentional about doing bullying prevention work for all children in 2006 when we formed the National Bullying Prevention Center. And the public internationally, nationally, knows us mainly through our three websites, 
Uh, Pacer.org slash bullying is for adults mainly. It's not inappropriate for children. It's just the main site where everything is archived. Uh, and it's great for educators, administrators. There's lots of curriculum up there. Unfortunately, none of it is translated into Russian. Uh, but if you want to use this information there or refer to any of it, you are welcome to do that. Uh, and there are a lot of things there that might be useful to you. Um, PacerTeensAgainstBullying.org is for middle school and high school for, for us would be from 11 years old through the end of uh, secondary school, so 18. Uh, and our mission is to you know, lead social change around the prevention of childhood bullying. So we really focus on what we would call kindergarten, five years old through 18 years old. Um, through the end of high school here. And that middle, that middle uh, URL is for uh, middle school, high school. And then the one on the right is the original site, PacerKidsAgainstBullying.org, which is for grades uh, kindergarten through fifth, which would be again, five years old through 10, 10 years old. Uh, and it's age appropriate. Uh, obviously the site looks like it's for younger children. Um, and there's lots of things for kids to do on both these sites. Again, not translated into any other uh, languages at this time, although we have resources in Spanish, uh, Hmong and Somali on the main site for um, adults. But often what happens on these sites, because I curate a lot of the online submissions, is that um, when folks are teaching English, uh, in their countries, they often use, for instance, Ask Carmen, which is a, an advice column that I write, um, or submissions about why students care about the issue of bullying, and they use it to practice uh, their English and they write in. So avail yourselves of that. Um, please know if there's an onslaught of advice <laughs> wanted, it might take some time to respond because there's a real person on the other end responding and um, putting those submissions online. So your students might be able to actually have their thoughts up on our website. Okay, so here we are today. Uh, we're going to be speaking uh, in the beginning about that commonality of uh, definition and terminology and it doesn't matter the group that I speak to. You're a very educated group. Uh, some of you are researchers in uh, and very, very knowledgeable on this subject. But what I have found uh, after speaking to, you know, 30,000 people in the last six years is that the terminology itself really varies. Uh, some of it could be cultural. Some of it is definitely generational. Um, but we really need to be speaking uh, with the same terms as close as we can get, um, given that we still don't have a unified definition. We're getting close. So that what I call bullying 101, which is kind of a that basic, you know, um, basic review of what we're talking about. We're going to do that first. I'll pause if there's any particular, you know, driving questions at that point for clarity. Uh, we'll take them and then we're going to move into uh, pro-social behaviors and what that looks like at, during the school day. Um, and then all throughout, we'll have resources that we have available that you, you can take. Most of what we have on those sites is free and downloadable. And what we do is we take, um, we take good research, you know, evidence-based information, and we turn it into accessible um, content for folks who are coming onto our site. Because what we found too is that very often the discussion of bullying is outside of what people understand, you know, parents and uh, various folks who are working with children. We needed to make it accessible. Uh, and so that's what we do. We take good research and turn it into content that anyone can understand and access. So that's where we are today. Throughout what we're talking about today, I want you to know that you're going to hear the subtext of the adult response. The adult response is critical and vital to moving this uh, problem of bullying prevention forward. 
very often when I speak to parents, what we end up speaking about is intervention. And so I want to make sure today that when you're out there speaking to other adults, you make this distinction between prevention and intervention. We know they're two different things, but very often people don't think of them that way. The only time they think about bullying is when it's happening to their child or when it has happened to them. And so we need to, to keep promoting out there in the world that we can get six steps ahead. Um, no one thinks that that's easy. I'm not saying that it's easy, but we need to start thinking of the fundamental formational steps to create a healthier community around our children, around our students, so that bullying happens less, so that it is not happening so much that kids are contemplating self-harm. So we need to get ahead of it. We all know that. And that's what my focus will be on. How do we do that as adults? One of the first questions I want you to hold in your mind is, do you believe in prevention? And I ask this question not to be <laughs> provocative, but for you to really take stock. Do you think, are you the type of person who thinks that we can prevent uh, a social ill like bullying? Do you think it's possible? Because if there are many people out there who do not think that it's possible and, it, and it's the lens that they see through. And because of that, they don't, they're not gonna spend a lot of energy on the prevention side of it. They're gonna think about all the things you need to do when bullying happens, because that's what they expect. They expect that it's a natural part of childhood. They expect that kids just do this. That's what boys do, that's what girls do, that's what kids do. So, you know, you don't put that type of forethought in there and you know, when that's your view of bullying. So for you yourselves, dig deep and think, am I a person that believes in prevention? As we've all lived through the pandemic, we know that there are a whole bunch of people that don't think you can prevent bad things from happening. You just have to let them happen. Uh, I saw that, you know, graphically during the last three years. Um, and I do think there are a few topics where people say, oh yeah, you know, I brush my teeth. I don't want to get cavities. And I'm making it silly because honestly, there are very few things where people think I can really put a stop to something with solid intention, information, education, and my energy behind it. So it's a question that I ask now of all adults. Are you the type of person to believe in prevention? I believe, of course, all of us who work with children are because once bullying has taken root, you know, in a community, it takes a lot of work um, to get a handle on it. And we want better for our kids. So I know that we are all on the same page here about that, but many of the adults you work with will not be. So being prepared to think about, you know, how do you greet those adults is so very important for all of us. Okay, here we go. We know uh, here in this country, almost every school, is going to have a, a bullying issue of some kind. Of course, when I speak to folks from schools, uh, depending on where they are, depending on the, you know who they are, what type of uh, student and family they have, they will tell me either, yes, please, you know, we need this information, or they'll say, you know, we don't see very much of that here. So there's a wide, you know, wide uh, variation in what people think is going on versus what kids know is going on. We don't often hear from kids as, or listen as often as we should. Um, so you'll hear that as well, that uh, we need to take kids' stories seriously when they come to us. We can figure out the reasons and underpinnings for those stories after, but we need to be listening very carefully. Once kids come to us and we give them bad advice or we don't have a receptive uh, listening uh, session with those kids, they're not coming back. So if we really want to influence the life of the students around us, the kids around us, we need to make sure of how we relate to them. One of the things that we need to remember throughout today and forevermore is bullying is a learned behavior and behavior can change. Once again, this is not a simple proposition. Bullying is a complex behavior. We know this. And so our solutions are complex and layered as well. And take time, take time, time, not a one-year initiative, not a two-year initiative, 
but a forever initiative uh, to really work on prevention. But the focus for you and for all of the adults and children around you, but this bullying situation is changeable. We can change it. We're going to figure this out. Bullying is a learned behavior. And how do we learn our social behavior? From viewing others' social behavior. And so the other thing you're going to hear throughout is, our behavior is critical. We model the social behavior uh, that kids watch and adopt and try out and think about. Yeah, so again, our behavior when we're in front of children and around children, critically important. Nothing, nothing will ever change that. All right, so some of the common views and myths, and we have a Big handout on this uh, up in our resource section on the main site. Um, these are just some of the things that transcend culture. They, they, I, every group that I've ever spoken to, people will ascribe to these ideas uh, that bullying just happens in childhood. It's just a natural part of childhood. It's a rite of passage. Uh, kids go through it, and you're better for it when you get through it, you'll be tougher and stronger. And I can't tell you the number of people who have come up to me and said, bullying made me stronger. Bullying made me the man I am today. Um, when I survived it, I knew I was tougher. We need to walk better for our kids. That's a very low bar. And in truth, um, bullying breaks kids down. It does not make kids tougher. And when people do talk to me about their bullying experiences, even if they feel they got something positive out of it, I can tell that in their minds, it is still very much alive, that experience. So the effects of bullying can be lifelong. They may not go away. And even the folks who feel that they got something better out of it, you know, that they became better, I think it's still alive for them inside, which is not exactly a good thing. Um, some of the, the particular ones here that I find fascinating is, um, you know, it's only teasing. That's what I grew up with, you know, get a thicker skin. It's only teasing. Uh, my mom said, uh, oh, they're just jealous of you. Yeah, it's just a phase. They'll stop, you know, just, just ignore it. And my father said, I'm going to teach you how to throw a punch and land it first. I was presenting to a group of uh, younger children, and this was a girl about second grade, so about seven, seven years old. And I said, you know, some people believe that you should, you know, hit first. And she said, oh, no, my grandma told me you don't want to hit first, you want to hit second. And this is a girl of seven years old whose grandmother was giving her advice about what to do. That's pretty old advice, right? And we know that it's not great advice. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Already at seven years old, she had absorbed an interesting lesson that could backfire hugely on her. Um, so the one thing that as disability rights advocates that we worry about is that some people deserve to be bullied. Uh, one of the risk factors for becoming someone who bullies others is sense of entitlement about difference. And so those differences can allow people to think, uh, that it's okay, their actions are fine because you don't share my religion, you don't share my whatever uh, world, you're not a part of this group. So whatever I do to you, you deserve. And of course, kids don't think in that level of detail. They just, you know, find a way to use the power of what they believe against someone. Um, in this country, we, we talk a lot about telling versus tattling or snitching is the word that's often used in a lot of schools uh, that you don't tell adults about what happens because uh, you'll get in trouble from your peers. So very important that we educate kids around um, the fact that telling is what you do to get help. That's an important one. We'll talk about that later as well. All right. So, what we do here with the definition, because there is no single definition of bullying or cyberbullying that everyone agrees to out in the world, which is interesting, don't you think? Uh, and, and understandable, certainly understandable, uh, but very interesting and leads to a lot of variability uh, in adult world when we're talking about it, which is confusing for children. Uh, so what we've done here is we've gone to the best definitions and we're using that word best um, meaning that they're backed by research. 
um, backed by evidence. We take the commonalities out of those definitions. We call them hallmarks. And there are actually four, but I have three up here right now because what I find with adults, uh, with parents, it's good to have three. They can put that in their mental back pocket and pull it out then when they're having a discussion about bullying. So here are the three um, that we think are most important and are common in all definitions. It's hurt or harm. It can be physical or you know, emotional, psychological. Uh, the target of the bullying really can never stop it. And if you think about the advice that you were given or that we often give to kids who are targets, you know, like ignore it or, oh, they're just teasing or something along those lines. What we're asking the targets do is kind of apply a solution that they cannot, they can't do, right? The target can't really do anything that's going to change this situation. That's one of the prominent characteristics of a bullying situation. And the reason why they can't do anything about it is because they don't have the power to do anything about it. The individual or group that is doing the bullying has the power, right? And so very little that the target can do on their own um, to fix this situation. People will tell you that, oh yeah, I just, you know, popped them in the nose and uh, they never bothered me again. Maybe so, maybe so, but that's that's unlikely to have a healthy resolution. So. We have to be very careful in the advice we give targets. They don't have the power to stop things. Now, uh, there are a couple things here that are, are missing. This is not a legal definition. In a legal definition here in the United States, you would have uh, something about repetition. So that it would be, a legal definition would sound more like severe and be pervasive uh, uh, actions that hurt or harm another person over and over again. And that's one of the things uh, we hang on to in order to prove that it's bullying. This is troubling for us uh, who work with children with disabilities because they may not be able to tell us that it's happened 37 times before, right? We've just maybe see something, maybe bruises on the arm or, or a change in behavior because they may be nonverbal or kids may not tell us because they're ashamed that they've somehow drawn the bullying onto themselves. So be very careful about that rep repetition. Um, very, very careful about that. So it's not included here, but it will be included in every legal definition. Uh, it's something that people want to see to say, hey, there's proof it happened more than once. It wasn't just someone having a bad day and they said something mean, right? That isn't bullying. And I'll make a difference for you in a second between conflict and bullying. But it gets really into a gray area when we say, oh, I need to see it happen more than once, or the child needs to express that it's happened more than once. It's tricky. We have to be pretty good detectives there. And one of the other things that is not here that you will see in most legal definitions, but is seems to be quietly disappearing from definitions, at least here, uh, and that is intention. So you'll notice uh, in that first phrase, the first bullet, it says hurt or harms another person physically or emotionally. And up until just a couple of years ago, we said on purpose, intentionally, right? So that the hurt or harm was done with intent. Now that's sort of starting to be removed from the picture, which there's a big argument over that. But for us, it becomes a big, again, a big detective game uh, to discover what intention is. And while we're doing that, when we receive a report of bullying, while we're doing that, very often the problem keeps going. So we're very leery of waiting around to figure out what the intent is when the impact of the behavior has led a child to contemplate self-harm or let a child to not want to be at school or let a child to think they're not worthy of being with this other group of human beings. So we're very careful with that intention and, and working with children with disabilities, they may never understand the intention of the behaviors coming at them. They want attention very often. Kids who are on the spectrum want that attention. They can't tell if it's negative or positive. And so the solution, I'm sure you're hearing it right now, is that we need to be involved in the solution. <laughs> we need the input of children, but we need to be watching. We need to be looking at this to see these dynamics because kids can't often tell us 
oh yeah, their intent was, it was purposeful. We have to figure that out. So those three things, minus the fact that what you'll see in legal definitions will probably include intention and repetition. All right, so keep that in your mind. Now, here is my one uh, <laughs> slightly um, active slide. And it is the difference between conflict and bullying. Early on, uh, it is very difficult to tell. And in fact, we don't use the word bullying for children who have not developed the sense in their own minds that they can actually cause hurt or harm in another child. So under about five or six years old, uh, a child doesn't, hasn't developed, most children haven't developed enough to say, oh, I hurt someone else. They just, they, they're not quite there yet. So we don't call children uh, in the before kindergarten here um, bullies. We never do it. In fact, we never use that word at all. And I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have to educate our parents and our students about the difference, because otherwise you're going to be hearing the word bullying all the time when in fact what they're discussing or trying to express is conflict. And so we need to make this distinction both for students and parents very clear and for ourselves. So with conflict, the power is equal. Yeah, the kids have equal power. Oh, one day one kid might be dominant. The next day the other kid might be. They tell each other what to do. There might be strong feelings involved. Yeah, and they might not be friends anymore after an argument. But generally it's give and take equal power, same playing field. Yeah, they're really, you know, that's just a friendship and a relationship and it's a healthy one and people have conflict. That is with us forever. That does appear to be a part of the human condition. So also with conflict, remember most kids do not want to lose friends. They certainly don't want to lose the ones they already have. But for some kids, they may not have more than one or two. They do not want to lose those friends. And so with conflict, if they understand that what they've done has caused, you know, some hurt in another person or interrupted the relationship, they will generally modify their behavior. Now, very often they cannot do that without our assistance because they don't know how. You know, they don't know how and we need to show them how to repair a relationship or how to apologize how to move on, whatever it is, but conflict and the resolution of conflict can create resilience in children, as we know, and we're teaching them how to do that. That's great. And we can do that with conflict. Um, bullying is another problem altogether. So when, if I have decided to bully you and I figure out what it is that, that bothers you, it may be calling you gay. I, you don't need to be gay because the difference that I perceive could be real or perceived. Again, it doesn't have to even be real, but I decide that's what I'm going to pick on. And that's what um, gives me satisfaction because I know that somehow I am causing a reaction in you. When I find that trigger, I'm going to keep hitting it. I'm not going to modify my behavior. And I don't have to because I have more power than you do. You can't stop me. You can't make me stop. And in fact, again, that's where adults need to come in and facilitate the resolution. And we need to let children know, both the children who are bullied and the children who are being bullied, that this is change is possible. This is a changeable situation. You're not stuck here. This is, it's awful and no one likes it, but behavior can change. The bullying behavior can change you don't need to stay a target forever. Yeah, you're not stuck. We don't want anything in our language and thinking to lead our students to believe that they're stuck forever in this bullying situation. We wanna make sure they know bullying is a behavior. Behavior can change. We can make this better. So just quickly, uh, we've all experienced a lot of uh, of internet use over the last few years, a lot of online teaching. Uh, my congratulations to you for having survived such a, an amazing pivot uh, to <laughs> online teaching overnight. And we're online and we're trying to manage our, our groups and we're trying to keep kids engaged. Amazing. Uh, in this country, there's some research around um, what happened 
uh, during that time, we didn't see a spike in cyberbullying um, that we thought we'd see. But, but again, sometimes we're not hearing the whole story from student world. And I do know of a lot of classrooms, you know, where there was stuff going on on cell phones while the class was going on online. I'm sure you you have the same thing, but um, so we know that it was happening. Here's just something to remember for parents so that they're clear on this, because I do find that a couple of the conversations that are not happening, uh, uh, one big one is around cyberbullying. And I, I think it's because when we got our smartphones or when we got our phones, nobody sat down with us and said, here is how you are going to use your technology ethically. Nobody did that for us. We just figured it out, you know? And so the people that, you know, have come after us, get their technology, they don't get much of an education. We've been trying to reverse that in this country for quite a while, but it takes time because again, the adults are modeling behaviors with technology that are not good. Uh, and so uh, I do know that for kids um, online, it's still relatively rare for them to be bullied or harassed by a stranger. Usually it's a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction first before the bullying um, becomes cyberbullying. But that could change. I mean, the potential is there as we know, because you're anonymous, you're not face-to-face. If you're bullying someone, a um, lot easier to be courageous about what you say. I'm courageous, I'm using that word. Uh, <laughs> easier to be negative, easier to be hurtful. Uh, and it can just go out to thousands of people depending on who's connected to you very quickly. Um, and you know, for all intents and purposes, it could be permanent. So while cyberbullying has the same characteristics and the same aims, uh, there's a lot of potential for it to be horrible. And what I find here is that parents are very worried about it. It's the monster in every room in my presentations, but I don't find that parents are active in setting up the conditions to prevent it and monitoring what their kids are doing online, whether it's messaging through gaming, uh, which is where a lot of the trash, trash talk is what we call it, but the stuff goes over the line with uh, communications between kids or the phones. So, you know, we give a smartphone to a child and in this country, the average age of receiving a smartphone is under nine years old now. And we, get, we connect them to the world and do, do not give them the support, uh, which means, you know, restricting how the world can get to them sometimes. So lot to think about there, but we'll move on through the Bullying 101 to get to the end of that. Um, so just make sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just very quickly, this is how we look at talking about bullying. Uh, you can put whatever categories you like and different organizations use different categories to speak about bullying. We look at it this way, but again, there, there's no right or wrong here because as one expert said, um, in a lecture that I listened to, ultimately all bullying affects the psychology of, of the target and the person doing the bullying and the community around them. So, you know, affects the mental, which affects other things. Um, so you can speak about it, um, you know, using whatever categories you want, but, uh, you know, just know that, that everyone does it a little different. Perhaps when we get towards more towards that unified approach, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll come up with uh, definitive categories, but <clears throat> Most important thing is that we're talking about it. So the, we try to use person first language. This is a reflection of um, our work in the disability realm. There are some you know, discussions about that as well among folks who have disabilities, whether or not you know, person first is the best way to express who they are. I'll leave those to other folks, but we never use the word bully as a noun, as a label for a child makes it inconvenient for your sentence creation, but it is vitally important that we not label children as bullies, children who are in development, who are changing every day, who often through the course of their day might be bullying someone, but also might be being bullied as well, and also might be a champion for another child who's being bullied. 
uh, maybe the only friend of someone who has no friends. So we have to be very careful with these labels because the roles for all children shift and change during the school day and during their whole childhood. So we don't use those labels. And as, as adults, we have the power to change our language to reflect the fact that their roles change uh, that the, they won't, they don't have to be someone who bullies forever. And the fact that no one is born a bully, it's learned behavior. You can learn something else. We're going to help you. You know, that that message is very clear. You are not stuck being the person who bullies or the person who's being bullied or having to watch this in your community. That's not forever. We're going to figure this out. We're going to figure it out together. Um, parents are always vitally interested who, who, who's, what's the risk factors for someone who's, you know, going to be bullied, uh, and someone who, uh, is going to bully others. And, you know, very rare that parents will admit until they see it or are very much confronted with, uh, the after effects of their child doing the bullying, but very rare that parents will want to confront the fact or admit that it's their child. It's a, it's a horrifying thing, uh, for parents. So, you know, there isn't a typical person who is bullied or who can bully. There are some risk factors, but they're not guarantees. So for, for becoming a target, you know, social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors. When children are connected to their peers and connected to the community around them, they know who to go to in adult world to help them. Um, they're, they, they are protected somewhat. Uh, just having one friend near a child reduces the risk that they'll be bullied. So very important that we figure out how to connect children, how to connect our community so that children know that they're cared for by the adults, but that also that their peers see them. I remember there's an interesting bit of research I read long ago about middle school kids when I was a middle school advisor uh, at a private school. It said, what, what uh, they asked middle school kids, what would make you feel as though you were gonna have a good day. And the kids said, when one of my peers says hello to me in the first thing when I get to school, sounds terribly simple, doesn't it? But imagine going through your school day with no one interacting with you. You would think you were invisible, you didn't belong. That sense of belonging permeates all of school life for children. Um, so, so that social isolation is a big risk factor. Reactivity, so kids with certain disabilities are often very reactive, and that is something that is very satisfying to a kid or a group doing bullying, that they get some kind of reaction or they get some kind of engagement uh, from a target. But again, not a guarantee. Uh, for being someone who bullies, that is tricky too. Um, it can be that that child is being bullied and they have no control in another part of their life. And so this bullying that they're doing gives them this sense of control. But one of the biggest risk factors is a sense of entitlement around difference. So whoever you are, whether this difference is real or it's just something I'm gonna say is a difference, um, that allows my behavior to be whatever my behavior is. I can be mean to you, I can exclude you, uh, all of those things. Uh, and it's okay because you don't belong. Yeah, terribly, terribly damaging. There's a bit of uh, research that just came out recently from Chad Rose, um, uh, University of Missouri. If you want it, I'm happy to find it for you and send it to you. Uh, we have been saying for years that the most <laughs> prevalent form of bullying was verbal because verbal is a part of everything and um, very quick and easy and can be very dirty uh, with done with a smile on my face, right? But Chad Rose uncovered um, a very recent research, and it, it's, I think, statistically relevant. He uh, found that um, for kids, uh, the most prevalent form of bullying uh, right now is social exclusion. That is the most damaging. And there was another bit of research that I'm sorry, I can't tell you who did it. I just read it last week. Um, saying that's, that that type of bullying can be very damaging, more damaging than being hit. So more damaging than physical bullying, that kind of social exclusion, you don't belong here, you don't even exist to us. And imagine that in a peer group, we've all 
been through it. Um, so it's it's a horrible thing to learn as a child and create scars that may not go away. So important to remember those things. Again, just to review what I just said, uh, those common risk factors. Um, you know, when we when children see a use of power that is negative like that, they may not do something right away with that information, but they may use that sense of, well, if I have power over someone, you know, if I know a secret that doesn't, they don't want to be told, I can get something from that person. Though those lessons may be enacted later on in life. We don't really want them to be learning that they can use their power in that mean or hurtful way. Um, but it is essential for all children, whether they turn into someone who wants to bully or is thinking about it or is a target, it's essential for them to know that that behavior can change um, and that they're connected, that their actions cause reactions in other people because of those connections. And again, this is something that we're thinking about and beginning to write about connection. How are we connected? How can we facilitate connection in our communities? Very important. Uh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right. So I know that you know this, um, but your parent, the parents who, again, are not, not uh, connected to the, the good information that you have or the education that you have may not realize that um, you know, bullying presents a lot like someone who's depressed. So kids who are being bullied don't want to be in the places that they're being bullied, whether that's the bus, whether that's the classroom, the sports team. Um, one of the areas that's, you know, really just being looked at very, very carefully is how do we promote positive coaching without tearing kids down? Uh, and uh, so, so if you see a kid avoiding the things they formerly enjoyed or the academic performance goes down, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you have a super student and they're not showing up in class, even when their body's sitting in the seat or they're just avoiding school altogether, you know, something's up, uh, your antenna go up. Um, but also at home, parents might be seeing, you know, sleep patterns change, uh, eating change. Um, there might be, um, you know, mysterious illnesses that crop up. So just all of a sudden, you know, uh, these symptoms, uh, and we know something might be going on that is not actually physical or the emotional toll and the mental toll has caused physical, actual physical, you know, reactions in the body, because we know that stress does that. So, uh, you know, there, the link to, to, suicide in this, uh, for, for issues of bullying. We know that kids and adults are hearing these tragic stories every day. Uh, and so very often the, the kids that I've encountered and we're seeing this a lot, they think that that's just, you're bullied. And that means, you know, you go straight to self-harm or suicide. We want to make sure that kids know that their support is available so that's not going to happen or there's less likelihood that that's going to happen. But we need to make sure they understand it's not inevitable that 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 tragic outcome will occur, uh, that they need if something happens that they don't understand bullying or anything else a problem that's bigger than them. And bullying is that kind of problem. They need to find an adult they trust. And as adults, when that child comes to us, we better know uh, how to receive that difficult story. It's going to be very, very important um, for us to receive that story carefully. And I'll, I have some tools for you uh, coming up, uh, but so that they don't slide into self-isolation, self-harm, uh, feeling as though no one and nothing can change the situation. We have too many tragic stories like that. We can do better, and and we will. Uh, if if this group is any indication, a marvelous you know attendance here today, and um, you taking the knowledge you gained this week out into your communities, I know that we can make a change here. Um, let's see where we're going. Okay, we're about to go to start the best practices section, and I just want to check in with my moderator.
to make sure that we don't have, uh, if I need to clarify anything that you think is really a hot button, otherwise I'll continue on. Thank you, Judy. Everything is fine. And our chat is filled with questions, multiple <laughs> questions. I know. So we we continue. Yes, I think that's a great idea then. Thank you so much, Tatiana. I appreciate that. All right. So let's talk about best practices. Um, social interactions are being viewed by our children all the time when they're awake, whether it's you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, so they're watching it in real life, uh, through the shows they watch, through the gaming they do, through whatever, they're watching, 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 and we know this. Um, but what we need to do as adults in the educational situations, uh, coaching situations, mentoring situations, is to structure activities for them that are developmentally appropriate but help them increase their social awareness uh, and social competence uh, and that are positive. So we need to structure success. I didn't know when I was growing up and I was what we call odd girl out. Um, I got through it, but I had to learn very carefully how to be friends. I came from a family culture that was very uh, lively, a lot of teasing, a lot of it was very mean. And I didn't know that you didn't do that uh, at school and you didn't do that with friends. And I didn't know how to make friends. My father was what we call a lone wolf. He didn't have positive social interactions. He's a good man, but very tough and didn't you know, didn't know how to model that type of reaction. My mother was some, somewhat similar. Um, but she just charged through the world. So I, <laughs> I didn't know how to be a friend. And consequently, it was always on the outside of social stuff. How much would I have benefited from learning how to be social with my peer group, learn to be less, in some senses, competitive and more cooperative. So we're going to talk about some activities and parts of your school day where you can could make that happen a little more often, but this is carefully structured, even if you're making it seem random, you know, that we are, we have design and intention behind how we're setting up our day, which I know you already do, because master teachers know that we cannot teach math or science until we connect with the child in front of us. We can hope it's happening, but if we're not, if the kids are not connected to us and really hearing us and seeing us, and more importantly, we're connected to them, seeing them, hearing them, we're not going to be able to make that curriculum really go over into their brains. Um, and we need to realize that the social emotional learning is a vital part of every single piece of our day and every single piece of the curriculum. Again, those relationships are background, but they're powerful background during the school day. That's why kids are there. Uh, yes, there are kids who are desperately interested in learning and want to go do something great in the world, but they can't do it. Uh, they can't do the learning if the social emotional world is, is not working. They can't do it. Yeah, it's, and if, you know, the adult analog is when we have problems, relationship problems in our lives, they are always that noise happening. We just become more adept, we get more skills and we can ignore it a little better, but it's still underneath. Children can't do that so much. And so we need to structure the day for successful social interactions um, so that our kids are connected to one another and connected to us a little bit better. Uh, and that for children with disabilities as well, that we uh, structure very individualized uh, interventions um, so that when we're creating solutions for them to be more connected or to fix bullying situations, it considers who that child is always. Um, how can we help them best? We have to know who they are, what their disability prevents them from understanding, and how we can, again, connect them to the larger community. Okay. Next, we are the safety net. There is no doubt about that. And sometimes I feel bad uh, with saying to, to adults, you know, you have to 
show them the behavior because it's it feels like I'm saying you have to be perfect. You cannot be perfect. Will you show them how you uh, repair from being imperfect? So that is a, a very good thing as well. Um, but the safety net looks like this. Every child knows who to go to uh, when something happens that they can't fix themselves or they don't understand. That means a lot of questions uh, and it can sometimes be exhausting, but that's what we do uh, as educators uh, and administrators in schools. We provide that safety net. Uh, and your staff, for those of you who are administrators or for the staff that are on the call, you have to be clear about how you document the stories that come to you. Um, what I find when I go around and, and I'm in school communities is that there are some schools where there is no clarity around what do I do when I receive a report of bullying. They really don't know. It's not clear. They're often asked to decide on the fly whether or not it's a bullying situation. And if you've been uh, on the field where kids are playing, whatever, and you are watching 100 kids, how accurate are you going to be all the time about whether or not what you've seen is bullying, if it's happening verbally, or if it's social exclusion where nothing is actually happening, but the child is not included? Sometimes you can see everything, and sometimes you miss, right? So when those reports come in, we really have to make sure we know what to do uh, and, you know, where our support is as staff, you know, and administrators, please uh, train your staff um, on, you know, what you're taking away from all of this this week. Show them, you know, clearly um, by your behavior and by what you, how you discuss bullying and how you discuss prevention, um, uh, what it is you expect of them. Yeah, make that very clear in, in any written instructions in your employee handbook, uh, in your parent and student handbook. Make sure they align. That those definitions are the same. Uh, what bullying looks like, what that behavior is, how it can present so that everyone is clear. Oh yeah, that's conflict. No, 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 that's different. That's bullying. And that could be something like harassment, discriminatory harassment, that these things are different, but you clearly outline for everyone what they are. Um, we believe every child has the right to be safe at school, but that's an ideal because practically speaking, that doesn't happen for all children. Um, the last thing that we're gonna talk about in a minute uh, in terms of our advocacy is teaching self-advocacy in our students, in the children that we uh, help, um, because our solutions also need to have the child's input. Yeah, it can't always be that we say, well, here's how it's gonna go. Sometimes we do, but we need the input of the children involved to really have a child-centered solution. And those solutions are just better, yeah because kids often want some things that are slightly different. Most of the time, targets just want the bullying to stop. It's the adults who want punishment. And kids know that with punishment comes retaliation, comes risk to themselves. So we have to be very, very careful with the consequences. Um, not saying that there shouldn't be consequences for those children who are bullying, but we have to be very careful how those things roll out. Um, okay. I call this a toolkit, <laughs> but this is the exact same slide that I would show parents. Because what we find is that parents often leap to action. They want to do something. And that's a very adult-centered response, right? We want to fix it as fast as possible. But listening, believing, and being supportive are the things that we want when we're in crisis, when we have problems that we you know, don't, can't fix, right? We just want someone to listen. Kids want that too. Uh, it sounds easy. And of course, you know, it is not. Uh, if you have children of your own, the first thing you do is you just get going, you know, like, ah, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this. Uh, it's part of our, our heart in not wanting kids to be in pain, right? So <laughs> that patience, and I'm not a patient person. So I'm telling you that this is a huge challenge. I know but we need to be patient. And the last two things on this list are the last things we do, right? 
go to the information and the intervention and all of that. Um, so if we're listening, we may even be actively preventing um, by offering um, our support, um, but knowing that we've, we, we, we may not be getting the whole story. We know that, right? But not feeling that we have to leap to being one of those detectives on the TV shows, you know, right away. Okay, ma'am, tell me what happened. You know, that we just give a receptive ear to kids. It's what we want as well. Um, so that is the toolkit. That's what I tell parents um, and educators. It's what we need to do. And, and I know that you know this already. It's just that sometimes it's less about leaping into action and more about sitting very still and receiving that story. Uh, our advocacy, as important as it is, is not the whole picture. We really want our students and our children to learn how to advocate for themselves. And this is core to what PACER does because working with children with disabilities, part of what gives them their power back in the community is teaching them to speak up for themselves. And we do this even with children who are nonverbal. We learn what their desires are, you know, what they like, what they don't like. And for children who have more of the ability to express themselves, Speaking up for themselves in some way or another, being able to say, here's what I'm good at. Uh, here's what I need help with. Um, please help me, you know, with this. That is the hugest life lesson that I can think of, knowing how to ask for help. And bullying is a situation uh, or, you know, even conflict where they're going to need us. But bullying for sure, it is not a child's responsibility to fix a bullying situation. That comes with our support. Um, but also, when bullying takes the power away from a child, self-advocacy starts to give it back. I Here's what I want to have happen. Yeah. And I'd like it to happen like this. Um, and knowing that they have the right to ask for that help and knowing that they have the right to get their education free of bullying and to be at school and not be scared. That's a powerful thing as well but knowing that they don't have to do that alone. Mm, now that makes it real, uh, makes it real indeed. So this is a tool that we have. Again, it's not translated, feel free to translate it, um, credit us, but feel free to take this into your communities and make it, make it your own. It's not um, complicated. Uh, and this tool makes it much simpler. And what we find with this is this tool is a de-escalation. Um, method. So it's going to help temper uh, the tempers. It's going to help calm down the emotions for adults and for kids as well, because it's methodical, it's process. And when you open this up um, on uh, the inside, there are scenarios, different bullying scenarios. Then there are examples of how you go through this. So like a grid, a table, and then on the back is, I believe it's the back or the third page, is um, just a blank grid to fill in. And somehow that white space on the page just lets everybody take a breath. Okay, this is how we're going to do this. We'll talk about what's happened, although step one may not happen first. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get all of the story. Um, but step two is the magical piece of this. That is the piece that changes this for targets uh, and for children who bully as well. How would you like this situation to be better? If this situation were better, what would it look like? That's the piece of self-advocacy. That's the piece that says this is a changeable situation. We're gonna figure out how to get this negative behavior to stop. You're not doing it alone, again, so a child doesn't feel like they're all alone in the world with this problem, isolated, alienated, uh-uh, no. There are adults who can help you with this. I'm one, I'm here right now. I don't know exactly what to do right now. I think it's it's good to share that with kids. I'm not sure you know, how we'll do that. And that's important to put in the conversation because kids will think, oh no, now an adult's gonna be involved. It's gonna get worse. And sometimes it does. Sometimes we are very clumsy in our attempts to fix uh, and things go wrong. So, 
we have to be very careful. And I think we need to say to kids, uh, your point of view needs to be in here. I will respect that. Um, but if there's safety issues, of course, we need to involve other people. We need to make sure that you are safe. And so sometimes that means that, yes, we're going to be having to talk to other people uh, and letting them know that that's part of creating that safety net for the child. But this is a great resource. Take it, you know, and come back to me and tell me, you know, how you used it and if it was effective. I just find that for adults, for your adults in, you know, teaching uh, whoever who don't feel that like they really know how to get through a problem and none of us are going to be perfect, but this really helps give them some structure for a difficult conversation. So avail yourself of this. It's, it's a really good thing. Um, all right. Cyberbullying advocacy uh, is a little tougher, um, mostly because people just don't do it soon enough. You know, it's much like talking about, um, you know, having sexual education talks. For some reason, people are very reluctant to dive in. <laughs> I, again, many theories about why that's so, um, but we need to be talking about online behavior very soon and we need to continue. Again, it's one of those things that you don't just get to have the one conversation and then run, you know, or just go back to um, whatever you're doing online. Your behavior online is going to have a lot of effect on kids. We, uh, for many years, and I'm sure in your countries as well, um, have been talking about, you know, who do you want to be online? So many people are other people when they get online. And adults are, are quite um, adept at changing their persona online. So that's one of the conversations we need to have. Who are you gonna be online? You're gonna be the same person you are having this conversation face-to-face. -face. Would you say that to another child or, or one of your friends? Would you talk like that? Would you post that picture? Would you like a comment that was mean and tore somebody down? Would you do that face-to-face? -face? Some kids probably would. Uh, but I think we're not thinking about that enough for ourselves and for the students. And also, you know, sometimes those behaviors and adults make a mess of this as well, but sometimes we think we're having fun and telling jokes. Uh, gaming is one of these places where it happens a lot in the messaging component. And a lot of parents may not realize how much messaging is going on, um, but uh, we call it trash talk. And if you've ever watched uh, an NBA basketball game or any uh, sport where the players are going after each other, sometimes they're having fun. They're enjoying it, right? Oh yeah, you're, you know, you play so bad that, you know, whatever. And sometimes it's fun. Remember the difference between conflict and bullying. You know, when that power is equal and the joking is equal, give, take, give, take. Okay, different. Everyone's enjoying it. Okay, that's fine. But when it crosses a line, and it may cross a line for a child who doesn't say anything, then it's 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 gone on into different territory. And as adults, if we're watching that, we need to shut that down. Um, their team team sports is rife, absolutely full of um, questionable social behavior, and the coaching, the coaches are the ones that set the tone of that. If we make it so that it's on my team, it's not acceptable to talk about other people's bodies. Just isn't, we're just not gonna do it. We're not gonna make jokes about somebody's feet or ears or anything, you know? No, we're not doing it. Um, or if you sense that it's crossed the line and then you shut it down. All right, you know, we, we were having fun on this and that's not fun anymore. Yeah, we have to make those observations. Generally, kids are not going to do that because it pushes them out of the peer group. So we need to be doing that. We need to be saying, yeah, you know what? That behavior is going to go bad. <laughs> so we're not going to let that happen. Um, if a child's bullied online, and there's a lot of advice out there about this. Um, again, this, this is culturally specific to us here in the States. Um, I think you can find your variation for wherever you are. Uh, one of the things that kids are most afraid of is that we're going to take the technology away. Yeah, that, and so they don't want to tell us because they don't want their phones taken away. They don't want, you know, their games taken away. And it's a lot of social interaction as we, we, as we know, you know, through the pandemic, that was everything, you know, those online things. But now kids, you know, have a large part of their social interactions are happening online, um, you know, 
That's how some people become, you know, faster friends, boyfriend, girlfriends. That's how some people become enemies, you know. So we, if we threaten to take that away when bad things happen, we're not going to hear about the bad things. So we need to document. We need to keep records about things that are happening. The school needs to know. This is, you know, largely a slide for parents. This is what I tell parents. The school does need to know if it involves the school. It's tricky here because for a long time, schools were saying, well, it happened after hours. It happened off-site, meaning not during the school day, not at school. But increasingly, legal challenges to that have revealed that, in fact, there's a responsibility of the school if it's happening at the bus stop. The schools are saying, oh, well, they weren't on the bus yet, so it wasn't school. Mm, well, it involved classmates. It involves you know, the school. So it, so that's changing. And again, it's a variable here. So I can't say that every school operates that way, but the school needs to know if it's happening between classmates. You must decide how you want parents to interact with you and be very clear about it. Um, and again, we live in a world where we need evidence. So we have to tell parents that you need to save some evidence. And this is difficult. I, I had a student working on my youth advisory board who is receiving intimate pictures from a boy, pictures of genitalia. Uh, and, and she knew this boy, she knew he was in trouble. He was in a different state. She had lived there and they had been friends when he was younger. And he started to send her these pictures when they got into high school um, for whatever reason in his mind. And she, even though she was working with us, on bullying prevention and harassment, and she knew that it was wrong. She was so scared and so felt so ashamed uh, that she couldn't tell her mother, who is a dear friend of mine and very savvy in the world. Um, instead, what her mother saw was increasing anxiety and nervousness. She knew something was up. This was her third child, and she knew. Uh, and, and she came to me and said, what do I do? I said, you got to ask her what's happening. And they sat down. They had that conversation. And then I had to say, you need one more picture. And they had to wait till one more came through um, to capture it because the girl had deleted everything that came. Of course, you would too. Ah, out, gone. Uh, and so um, they had to, to have that piece of evidence in order to get the boy help. And that enacted a whole horrible thing. You know, it was horrible. It was horrible for the child to realize that this boy needed the kind of help that was going to um, uh, require, you know, the law to step in and then uh, help for him, mental health for him uh, in his situation. So we all along, we have to scaffold that support to let them know this is, this is what's going to make it better for this other child as well. He can't continue to do these things. He's in terrible trouble and needs help as well. So that was a terrible situation, but just to underscore the need for evidence um, that parents need to know that, kids need to know that. All right. So um, the two gentlemen who did this research have uh, a wonderful site on cyberbullying, cyberbullying.org. Uh, they uh, do research all the time uh, and publish it. Uh, they are, um, a great resource for you. Uh, cyberbullying.org is their website, not translated again, but hopefully you can find some way to use it. Um, they did a recent study that shows that, that if we're going to tackle something like cyberbullying, we have to do it together as a community. Um, the community has to be uh, involved, um, a very layered approach, right? So it's not just the family. It's not just the family and the school or just the school alone, which often happens like what's happening at home, what's happening at school, you know, and then they people kind of point fingers. But but no, it's the entire community that has to be involved. Law enforcement should be involved in a positive way ahead of time to say, look, there are consequences for what happened. But, you know, we're, we're going to help uh, ahead of time. We're, we're, we're good adults to have um, in the picture. Uh, social media companies need to bear a greater responsibility uh, for shutting things down. And currently, it's difficult to get things removed. I, there's a situation at a school here in Los Angeles where the kids have uh, set up a fake page to discuss um, the, to the principal and the assistant principal. Uh, they should be uh, lovers. 
And uh, they had all these reasons why they should be together and they posted all this stuff. And it really, really impacted the adults at, at the school. Um, they could not get Instagram to remove this. Uh, and I'm calling them out because uh, I just want you to know, to be aware of the reality. You know, the kids set up these fake pages and it can take adults down. You know, that wasn't a real situation. Then the kids created this situation that caused an enormous amount of stress uh, for faculty and staff. Um, and it was sad and it interrupted the kids learning as well, obviously. Um, so we all need to be involved. It isn't just one person. Um, so let's talk about pro-social behaviors and the school day. Um, pro-social behaviors are the ones that are cooperative, um, that, uh, you know, where my action impacts you in a positive way. Um, positive social behaviors. The um, ones that we're focused on, and these aren't, you know, this is not like you're going to be surprised here, you know, these are not surprises, um, but the three that appear to be protective, and it's early days. I mean, it's early days for a lot of research and bullying. We don't have many, many generations uh, of um, research on what might prevent. We're getting there. We're getting there, and we're getting much, much better at looking at, you know, um, preventative behaviors, but the three that are influential that we can really affect as adults, that we can really help with as adults. Um, kindness, and there's a lot of talk about kindness, but when I, when I talk to kids and I talk to parents, there's a lot of like, we talked about kindness, it didn't work. But I'm not talking about kindness that is spineless. I'm talking about kindness that is the true strength, that is the true power of, of even warriors, the, the, the strength to include, the strength to accept, yeah, which are the next two, acceptance of difference and inclusion. When kids feel that they belong, that whatever difference they may have, whether it's a disability or religious or whatever, but that they are part of the community that cares about them, that reduces bullying. Uh, because kids care about one another, they're not they're, they're much less likely to victimize another person or target another person when they know that person is connected to them uh, and that their actions can really change another person's life. Um, so of the three here, I would say the, the most difficult one for adults to find examples of and therefore model is uh, that acceptance of difference. Like we have a lot of examples and we talk about it in the school day, especially with younger children. We seem to stop talking about it as much once kids get into, you know, 11, 12, 13, and what we call middle school here and high school, we seem, you know, we get a little more hands off, which is developmentally appropriate, but we, we, we let the kids take over a little bit. And sometimes we still need to be in there saying, no, 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 these things are important. Um, but the kindness inclusion we talk about often, and we say, you know, um, you know, be kind, although we don't, you know, show it as much sometimes, but, and include others, you know, concrete examples are not difficult to find. It's that acceptance of difference piece that really is so difficult because they need modeling. That is an abstract concept. They need modeling to make that concrete. We need to show it. And we know our world is not set up that way. We know they have plenty of examples out there, but I would like to offer to you that the world around them, their school world, we should be creating as, as much as possible an ideal world for them to gain success lessons and in social interactions, to understand that if they are different or even if they are perceived as different, they can still function well as a human being and in our world, in this world of our school, uh, they can, they can come into this place and it's a better place than the larger world, which is often unfair and cruel, especially to people who are different. Uh, and identity-based bullying, that's again, one of, one of the most damaging forms of bullying, according to recent research, that, that really, really can last a lifetime. So we need to work on that acceptance of difference piece and it's gonna take our involvement, our active and intentional involvement day after day after day. That's a forever thing. We don't get to sort of say, all right, this year at our school, we're doing acceptance of difference. And then next year, you know, we'll do, you know, technology. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, we have to be intentional every, every day. So our school day, 
the big picture strategy is this. Um, we always want to be, you know, developmentally appropriate in, in what we're doing. Of course, you're going to know your grade level best or your school culture best. Uh, and we're going to try and include kindness, acceptance, and inclusion throughout the day. But the equation doesn't happen without adults mentoring, modeling, and teaching these tools. And of the three mentoring, modeling, teaching, probably the modeling uh, comes first, mentoring, and then talking about it is third, um, but intentionally and consistently. Now, as kids get older in this country, often what we see is teachers saying, hey, I teach math. Yeah, I don't do that stuff. Yeah, I, I, that's not my thing. Um, I had a teacher at the school where I was who said, oh, when the girls come to me with their girl problems, I send them down the hall to Mrs. McBride. And our head of school said, nah, not again. That's not happening. Now, obviously, there are some places where you probably need to pull in another colleague for certain kinds of stories. But what he was saying is, no, when a child comes to you, you need to be a listening ear. You can't just slough that off on somebody else who you think does it better than you for whatever reason. Yeah. So we need to be trained in receiving those stories. Again, you know, I've said it like 100 times. I'm going to keep saying it. They're not easy. It's not easy to receive and listen, but we have to. Um, so here's some parts of your school day, obviously. You know, we've all seen those videos of those cute classroom greetings where, you know, the kids touch something on the wall by the door um, uh, to say hello to their teacher. It's a check-in, right? It's a check-in of, um, you know, uh, how the kid is doing. That check-in, seeing them is critically important, right? So we need to know how they're feeling. And there's fun ways to do that. You know, you can say hi, you can do a little dance step, you can do a fist bump or whatever it is, but we need to check in beginning of the day and the end of the day, right? And in the middle and all throughout, you know, often after recess uh, is when things have happened and we need to sit down and check in. Um, so here's just a list of things where you can, uh, maybe find some places to do these check-ins. Class agreements, the beginning of the school year, a great way to set up the expectations for behavior in your classroom. Um, not just when problems arise, which is what we often fall back on because we got a lot of things to do with the classroom minutes, right? Um, but when we're having social emotional issues, those things will take precedence, whether we like it or not. So getting to them um, proactively uh, is going to be better, yeah, as opposed to just when the emergency, when the fire erupts and, you know, everything has to be shut down. So here, those are some ideas, activities and games, setting those up carefully, um, this, that, that's to, to be very careful in those senses, um, but those are some ideas right there. And uh, Activities. So we all know that stories um, are a great way for uh, for kids to develop empathy, to identify with characters and stories and start the discussions that we need to have that might be difficult because we can speak about it in the third person. Well, you know, this boy, he he got hurt, but he didn't tell anyone and it just got worse and worse and worse. What would you do? Um, you know, gives us a really good opportunity. Sometimes videos can do that, too. Whatever works for the kids that you're interacting with, both are great, but stories by and large are still a great uh, vehicle for learning, obviously. And leadership, you know, again, this self-advocacy piece, you know, structuring successful leadership among kids who are not the obvious leaders. There's always what we call the diamonds in the rough, right? The kids that have some leadership capability, but they don't often get the chance to do it very carefully structuring those things, uh, letting them lead one another, again, very carefully because that can, you know, implode. So we want to be careful with it. But if we can structure it successfully, sometimes kids will see each other differently then. And changing those roles that can sometimes be cemented in at five years old, you know, class clown, uh, you know, girl who doesn't belong, those things can get cemented early. And if you let kids shine in different ways, if you structure that in your classroom, some of those roles can shift and change and kids can belong in a different way. Um, and obviously we love to see uh, creative 
uh, expression um, uh, for connecting kids together. We actually have contests and I would love to see something from Kazakhstan uh, videos about why you know, your students care about bullying. And we actually have a script um, or ideas that you can follow to create these videos. We love to see those. We love to see artwork about bullying. We, we love all that and things that highlight this acceptance of difference. Um, love to see what students are thinking and how they would solve things. We call it students with solutions and it's critical. And <laughs> one of the last things before we wrap up, um, I think I was a full up grown up, maybe in my 30s, before I realized there was such a thing as a cooperative game. So games where you had to mutually uh, come together. There wasn't just a winner and then all the rest were losers. Like I literally did not know that those existed. That was not my family culture. You know, it was all like, uh, so there are cooperative games where if the group doesn't come together, and figure out how to do it. And again, they have to be, that has to be scaffolded, but you can create um, a living idea here that, hey, we're just better when we connect up together and offer each other solutions. So um, again, there are a whole world of cooperative games out there. Ha, who knew? Now we all know. <laughs> um, you'll figure it out. For uh, bystanders, Obviously, there are kids, the majority of kids in your school are not involved, actively involved, but they are witnessing um, aggression. They're witnessing things they don't like. Activating them is really important, but you must be careful because you must not ask kids to get in the middle of a bullying situation with a, it. it it's just can backfire on them. They can become part of being targeted. So reaching out to the person being targeted, telling them they need to speak to an adult, just sitting and listening to a target story is, is so important. That's what kids who are being targeted say they want the most, a peer to sit with them and listen and just say, hey, you didn't deserve that. Yeah, you need to, to maybe talk to an adult. Do you want me to go with you? And um, things like that. Again, connection, you're not alone. Uh, I think this is what you should do. Um, and um, I know a good adult who really listens. You know, those are things that kids feel that they can do most often. It's a rare child who will spend their social equity and get up in the face of someone who's bullying. It's a rare child. We don't do that either, by the way, in adult world. So you got to be really careful with that advice um, and to be positive and to be friendly to a person who's being targeted is, is what kids say they want. Again, it doesn't just depend on one person to fix this. It isn't just the principal or the assistant principal or the head of school or you know just the parent or whoever, just the teacher to fix it. No, it takes all of us. And we all have a role to play. Um, we can be doing something every day, as I'm sure you already are. Remember, please, it is not a child's responsibility to fix a bullying situation. They cannot do it. Uh, they need us in there and we have to be careful about how we are in there um, to make the situation better. Watch out for discussions of zero tolerance. That was very uh, fashionable and it still is in some places. We do not tolerate bullying. If you bully, you're out. That really doesn't help fix the situation. It will not deter children from bullying in the future. And this is big news for some people, but zero tolerance has not been shown to be effective as a deterrent. Maybe it removes the immediate problem, but that child that you send down the road to another school, if there's another school for them to go to, is not gonna get the support they need. Um, I, I, the community isn't going to, to move on to a place where bullying happens less frequently. I mean, sometimes you have to remove children from your school community, but as a, a plan for bullying prevention, zero tolerance does not work. So I please, I advise you to take a look at that and find your own attachment to consequences that does not include it, but do, do, you know, do your homework on that zero tolerance policy uh, because we all really do need to work together um, to affect the change that we want for prevention. And again, lastly, the adult response. Um, we need to be showing the behaviors we want to see. 
And we know our responsibility is to keep schools safe. It's not just to teach our respective subject areas or help kids in our specific area. We need to show them what it's like to be connected to the adult on the other side of the school, uh, that the, the man or woman who cleans the school is just as connected to me as an administrator, as is the science teacher, as is you know the parent over here. We are connected. We are the adult safety net. And we set the tone for school culture. We are the support and creation of the school culture. We show every day what that's to be. Um, I'm very grateful for your listening ears. I know it's so very late for you. <laughs> and I appreciate um, you listening. And I hope that together that we can create a world where bullying doesn't happen or happened far less than it's happening now. I believe that we can, and I'm not naive. I think that if we are intentional uh, on promoting positive social behaviors and showing kids what to do, we can create amazing change. So thank you. Thank you very much again. And I'll take questions. I know again, it's late. I'll stay as long as you like. Judy, thank you so much. You know, the relevance and the response uh, to your presentation is the number of questions. Uh, we have over 57 questions received oh uh, from our online participants. This is true. And I do understand some of our participants uh, see 2 a.m. on the clocks. Oh, my goodness. So we are going to have a brief Q&A session. First of all, Judy, please help us once again. I do understand that. You have mentioned this in the presentation multiple times, but still we have a few questions. Dividing bullying from other forms of destructive behavior. For example, bullying and fight in a school. Is it the same or not? If children give names to each other, is it bullying? Is it harassment? If children give names to one person in the class, is it bullying? Is bullying a violence happening in a school environment? And if this ha if this happens in school environment, so let's get back to these categories. This is the first day of our work uh, of our workshop series, so we should be on the same page. In terms of categories, the category apparatus, as we call it, we, uh, we believe should be on the same page for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Uh, so we look at it like this. Um, conflict is a form of human behavior that's always gonna happen. Uh, equal power between the participants, um, you know, giving, getting, um, same game. They're they're on the same they're on the same page, uh, but there will be there will be disagreements and there will be fights. Those are those are natural. What differentiates conflict from bullying is uh, the sense that it is an ongoing pattern of behavior. Perhaps this fight hasn't been repeated before, but it's part of um, a pattern of negativity towards one child or towards a group that's been going on. That's the repetition piece. What's difficult about the repetition piece sometimes is that it's difficult for us to see. So I'm careful with repetition, right? We may see an outburst that looks like it's just, it's just happened. It's just one time. Oh, that, the kid's just having a bad day, but it could be the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is when as adults, we need to get active to figure out, you know, has this, um, it does, is this child part of something larger? So conflict, again, equal power, kids will fight. Yes, it's true, it does happen, uh, but not all aggression is bullying and not all bullying is harassment. So and if we use harassment as a legal term, right? Um, in this country, we have, seven or eight protected classes, uh, gender, um, uh, nationality, country of origin, religion. If you're bullied on any of these protected classes, then that's, that's discriminatory harassment. Disability is one of them as well. So if my bullying 
of you is centered in your disability, you know, you're a moron, you're stupid, you're retarded, whatever, then that bridges, that crosses the line from bullying into the legal idea of harassment. I am not a lawyer. I will tell you that. So you will need to, you know, if you're having problems like that in this country, you need to probably escalate and get some, some advice on that. Um, as far as, uh, if I saw, if I, if there was a physical altercation, if there was a fight, I would need to have a lot of information. And here's the problem with, uh, you know, sometimes with advice and scenarios is that, you know, bullying discussions have to be situation specific. So if I'm sounding general, it's purposeful uh, because you're going to think of scenarios where, you know, well, there's a lot of gray area. Again, bullying is a complex behavior, but let's go to um, name calling. So again, there are kids that will trash talk and, and call each other names and it's, it's cooperative. It's, uh, you know, reciprocal. They're, they're doing it. They think it's funny or whatever. It may be inappropriate, but it can, it doesn't have to be bullying. But when you said, you know, kids are giving names to one person in the room, I was like, ding, that's, that's bullying. And if those names are centered in something of that child's identity, then I'd say it's going, moving on over into harassment. Again, difficult for me to know without it being an actual real scenario and, and all of us seeing this exact thing that's happened. But when you said a group doing something to one, that's about all I needed to hear. Now, some kids will think that the attention they're receiving from that group is wonderful because they don't get any attention at all. And so they may take that name calling as a badge of honor, but we as adults have to look at that and see what does that do to the community in my classroom? You know, is that causing a culture shift towards, you know, everybody can be calling each other names and a group can use their collective power even if they, everyone's sort of thinking that, oh, it seems funny. Like I have to weigh that as an educator at the front of the room to decide what that does for the group. Um, because once they leave and they go uh, in the hallway or they go out to, to recess, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening that I don't, I can't see. So, um, but, you know, I, 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 so names are, that's super tricky. Um, but that dynamic of a group to one person. And then, um, I'm not sure I got this right, but is all violence bullying or is all bullying violence? Um, you know, I see bullying, whether it's physical or any of the other kind. Well, well, we speak about the school violence. Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, violence that happens in schools. Okay. Um, so. This is violence, including physical violence. So is it bullying or not? Uh, again, without having specific scenarios, no, not all aggression would be bullying, probably. Um, uh, but I, we do see all bullying as an aggressive act because it's an abuse of power. So it's using your power uh, to hurt or harm somebody else. That's aggression. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's damaging. But it's possible that fights can erupt um, they don't come out of nowhere usually. So there's a fray in the social structure or kids that, you know, just like us, the chemistry does not look good and it blows up. Um, again, I, I'm careful with intention and repetition, but usually there's some signs socially that something's not right. The kids that don't have conflict resolution skills and things just escalate and escalate. I mean, we we usually have a little bit of information on that going into it. Um, fights, I mean, yes, they can come out of nowhere, but generally there's there's something. And again, we're creating the community and culture, hopefully, you know, at the beginning of the school year um, and, and ongoing, we're, re, you know, setting it up and then resetting um, how we want that culture to look. So a lot of words there. I don't know if we got close, but I hope we did. And there's more information online. Um, about the differences, we we've written a lot about that. So, you, when you're when it's not two a.m., you can have <laughs> another look at all those because that's very, you know, we're really teasing out of the gray area um, uh, what you might be seeing. Okay. And then we are going to the 
surveys and studies, how researchers evaluate efficiency of anti-bullying programs and where we can get evidences of proofs of uh, efficiency of such anti-bullying programs. Maybe you have any sources. We do. I, we actually um, really love our government's uh, website, uh, stopbullying.gov, because they use research from the CDC on school violence and school climate. Uh, also, individual states in the United States will do sometimes biennially, biennially, sometimes, I don't think they do it, I don't know, maybe some states do it annually, but they'll do something, California's call it a uh, healthy kids survey. Uh, and they'll survey a couple different age groups, you know, statistically relevant samples, you know, of, of everybody at the seventh grade level, which is 12 years old. Um, and they will ask questions. And you can look all of this up. This is all in the public domain. You can go and find this. Um, they will ask them, you know, are you connected to an adult? Are you, uh, um, what do you see? Uh, have you contemplated suicide? Do you have risky behavior or whatever? And um, so we rely on those things. Oh, thank you. Stop bullying .gov. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where we go for some of this. Uh, and the research has shown that bullying prevention programs do have a positive impact. We have that statistic up on our site as well. And I'm sorry, I, I, I can't tell you exactly where it comes from right now, but it is up there under, if you go on the main site to uh, uh, resources or information, we've changed the tabs recently, sorry, but there's statistics and facts um, in that drop down menu. And you can go and you find that. And once you get there, the citations are on the bottom. You'll you can track those back to the sources, but we do rely on um, the government studies here, and they're quite good. Thank you. There's there are, there are multiple questions about bullying and about the role of teachers and parents and other family members. Here's one of the questions. When you start working with a child who is subjected uh, to bullying and uh, his or her parents, you find out that the parents of the child were subjected to bullying and they did not cure their traumas. Um, uh, do, you, do you know any research on the topic or maybe this issue was not investigated? No, I mean... That that's a factor that I feel uh, makes uh, an appearance in uh, you know uh, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the content that I see. If you want, I'd have to think about uh, about the research on that. But that is talked about quite a lot: the family culture and the family dynamics. Often, kids um, are being bullied at home, although that's not part of the classic definition. It's usually childhood school you know, environment or peer to peer bullying is what we think of. But I can tell you just anecdotally that every day I get emails from kids about, you know, it's my brother, it's my sister, it's my parents, it's my, you know, like there's, there's a lot of bullying happening in the, in, in the family. I don't, I honestly don't know how to direct you to that, but I do believe it exists. And, and hopefully if there's other presenters on the call, they'll be able to, to get you there. Um, but yes, no, we, we know that the family culture can cause issues for kids at school. And that's not just for bullying, but for everything else. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't direct you to anything specifically, but I know it exists. Judy, are there any practices of uh, working with the children who bring bullying to school from their families. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for me as an educator, differentiating the world that we're in when we come to school, the world that the child is in uh, is really important and that we set up the, um, not just what the consequences will be for, for bullying behavior, but that we are setting up the idea in our school culture that if we see certain things um, or if before they happen, who this is who we are going to be. Um, so again, back to your classroom agreements um, that aren't just about consequences. See, that's an adult framing, I think, 
um, you know, that we're thinking, if you do this, then this will happen. But instead, if we do this, here's what we're going to be able to do, right? And so that best practice of showing um, positive, what are the positive outcomes and uh, reinforcing that daily um, is, is huge. Um, again, the consistency across staff and administration is super key, right? It's super important. You 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 have to be on the same page as to as from the administration perspective. What do you expect your staff to do? How do you expect them to be trained? Here, I can say that there are a lot of staff that are not trained at all, or they send two people from the staff to the training, and then they're supposed to come back and faithfully render everything they learn to the rest of the staff. And we're not talking about like small number. We're talking about two people going, coming back and talking to a hundred people who are all going to have their different lenses on about what they understand about bullying. So your training is key of your adults, what your expectations are when they receive stories. Um, because when a child comes from a family where bullying is embedded in, in the family culture, you know, we're going to have a really hard road uh, dealing with the child and the family. But in our school environment, we get to set up um, a kinder ground, a kinder um, interaction between the adults, uh, a more expansive one. Uh, and so that when they come to school, they can expect um, that this is how adults treat one another. This is how adults treat children. This is how children treat one another. So very, very clear expectations. Uh, offering support to children who are being bullied or, or who, are, who are viewing domestic violence or anything violent in the home, you know, and there are psychologists on the school, uh, on the call, so you know, you know, we handle those things very carefully, offer support, but I think sometimes what's missing is making sure that that child feels they belong wholly in their school community, and so without giving this information to the uh, to their peers, making sure that the peers um, are including this child and that they know that there's a potential for relationships to be very different at school. Um, again, you have to customize this for your school community, but it is, uh, again, that, that powerful sense that I belong somewhere where everyone treats one another with respect is, is critically important. I hope that helps. Yes, indeed, this was a precious answer. And we have many questions about, uh, uh, about how parents and teachers and children should communicate with one another. The parent community, uh, we're wondering what, what, what difficulties uh, parent communities uh, see and anti-bullying programs that you have in LA. We do understand that parents neglect this problem. They want to look at it. And, and, uh, and have, you, have you seen cases when parents uh, would humiliate teachers, uh, would, would write complaints about teachers, uh, like crazy complaints, and then they... Uh, actually bully or harass even a oh, teacher yeah. for for creating a, a favorable and enabling environment. So in case you see this, what strategies do you have to, to work with such parents? Um, I, I don't know, you know, if it's, it's getting worse. I know in my heart, I feel as the people, especially since the pandemic, are very agitated. Um, but for many years now, we in California is one of the most litigious states in the nation. There, everybody it's goes to lawsuit immediately. You know, it's like something you did something wrong with my child. I'm going to sue you. You know, that happens a lot. Um, and I'm speaking as a, a private person here. There's not a there's not a pacer view on this, but uh, we do see that there is this tremendous escalation immediately. It can't be my child's fault or um, my child has been wronged uh, and you need to fix it. And if you don't fix it, I'm gonna sue you. You know, that's a very much, uh, th that happens quite, quite frequently. And that harassment of adults in the school, I hear stories every day. 
every day, every day. And my friends who are teaching are exhausted by that. I mean, how much is a teacher supposed to do, um, you know, in schools, you know, twisting themselves into pretzels? Here's, here's what, here's the take that we have on it as folks who have tried to mentor families for 50 years. We want, and, and, and by the way, even with the laws in place for, for children with disabilities to receive a fair and appropriate education, they do not. There's not the money, there's not the staff, there's all these reasons why sometimes schools can't provide it. Um, and we still say to parents, you're in partnership with the school, okay? And so we have a huge section of the National Bullying Prevention Center website devoted to what parents need to know. Now it is specific to Cal, uh, to excuse me the United States, and there is even some Minnesota specific to the state of Minnesota because that's where our home office is. So you'll see that there. But I, and again, it's in English, so I apologize for that. But it is schools have told us that it is a de-escalation device to have parents go through this site to give it as a resource to say, I know you know that this is just hugely emotional for all of us. We don't want this to happen. Um, but there might be some good information for you here. Um, uh, so we walk them through, again, definitions and dynamics and roles, and then law and policy. Um, and then we go to, how do you help your child? How do you have those conversations? We actually scaffold them. We actually give them dialogue to have with their kids. And then how do you work with the school? So all along, we're saying you're in partnership with the school. You're in partnership with the school. Yes, I know you're angry. Yes, I know you're concerned and worried. And you're in partnership with the school. Now, sometimes things end badly and the child needs to not be at that school. And I've had plenty of calls like that where, you know, things just don't happen to resolve the situation. The child's in danger. You know, it's so, but we've been told that it helps promote dialogue to go through this type of information. So you can look at that as a starting point anyways, um, to give your parents something that they they can, so they feel they have tools. Um, and for them to, have, to receive the education you've received today, I often will do a faculty staff presentation and a parent presentation, and I'll tell them, I got to do it on the same day. And all the adults who come, and it's hard to get parents to come to those because if it's not a hot button issue for their kid, it's not going to happen, right? But I try to get all the adults uh, to get the same terminology and the ideas uh, as clear as can be on like the same day because they always want me to talk to the students. And I say, I will not talk to the students until I speak to your adults in the community. So educating the adults uh, about what bullying is, so many adults need that. And I'm talking about not just your parents. There could be a lot of staff that are still holding on to some of these old ideas. It's what their grandmother told their mother and told them. You know, it's like, it's just the gift that keeps giving this misinformation around bullying. It's our job then to clarify all of that, to say, no, that's conflict. You know, that wasn't bullying issue. I know it's bad. And we were, we've, we've got all the kids in dialogue. Well, another problem that happens here is that we can't, for privacy laws, for privacy reasons, we cannot tell the other family, you know, the family of the child who's targeted what disciplinary actions have been done uh, for the child or group who are bullying. We are not allowed to do that. And you can understand there's practical reasons why you wouldn't do that, you know, but that causes an enormous amount of um, feelings. <laughs> really bad feelings and the idea that the school is doing nothing because the other the family doesn't know what's been done so you I don't know how you handle those things in Kazakhstan but it's again it's an information and sort of process flow issue that you know keeping everybody in the loop things are happening I can't tell you what they are but we're as concerned as you are again this idea of partnership because there's an awful lot of that finger pointing and then when that escalates, uh, I believe that teachers come under fire because they're the they're, they've got the, the least. Again, it's a power thing, you know. The, the teacher has not quite the same power as you know the administrator, or their supervisor, or as the head of school. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's a low low hanging fruit, is what we say in English. So, indeed, Judy. 
I think when we are speaking about it, all of our participants uh, think maybe we'd better neglect uh, those cases uh, because uh, it's so difficult to navigate uh, through this bumpy road. But colleagues, we should not uh, stop and we should uh, look for solutions together with the parents being in one loop and we teachers and ped pedagogues and know that bullying should be viewed not only from the optics of parents or even children, but in other levels. Yes, Judy. I, I wanted to urge you too in that loop, and thank you. That's that's that is that's a really good way to put it. And in that loop is also the child, because it's it's uh, when I was growing up, I went to Catholic school, and you know the nuns and the priests. That's it. They were the authority. Everybody, even the even the adults, were like, okay. Um, and what was missing always was what is what does the child want? What is important for the child's development in this? But their input changes so much. When parents hear a child, and we've used that student action plan with kids as young as like six, because kids can say what they want, they can. And that's part of their learning, their life lesson learning. But when parents hear children speak up for themselves, there's a point of pride about that. And that partnership is even even more pronounced than when the child is saying, well, what I really want is for him to stop taking stuff from my desk. That's all I want. Oh, well, that's concrete. <laughs> I think we can do something there. That's a minor problem, but sometimes those minor problems are the seeds of things that, you know, blow up later. Or if child says, look, I just don't want to be bullied anymore. I, I, don't, don't make a big deal out of this. I just want that to stop. And then we know we have to move very quietly behind the scenes. Um, but somehow getting that child's point of view in the loop can change some of those dynamics, I believe. And it's a, it could be a point of pride to say, you know, um, we can we can pull something out of this situation that makes success for this child. It makes them feel that they get that power back. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring words uh, and a few questions of regulatory character. Is there any anti-bullying act in the US? Is there any anti-bullying regulation at the school level? Is there an officer at school in the US, apart from the school psychologist, to, uh, to work on bullying issues? Well, maybe you can refer to the California cases. Um, this is a great question and it reveals a lot, again, about who we are as adults, right? So there is no federal law against bullying. I will direct you to stopbullying.gov because they actually have an interactive map where you can see law and policy for various states. This is fascinating because you will see that some states have both law and policy. You know, they have things very very clarified, but you'll also notice there'll be variations. So let's say the state of California, the California Education Department of Education uh, has, you know, all the policy for everything uh, and um, it outlines what bullying is and, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then this, the public school districts uh, then in California will take that and put it into most often into their uh, their policy, their district policy, because um, that's how public schools are governed here, district wide. Um, some districts are very small, one school. And some districts are like uh, Los Angeles Unified, second largest school district in the nation. Hundreds of thousands of students. Or, you know, it's huge. But uh, district will then uh, have their policy, which is taken really from the state, right? Uh, and then they'll further write a parent student handbook and um, pull that language also into the employee. I'm going to say handbook, but I don't think they call it that. Uh, never mind, whatever information they're giving to staff. Um, uh, so, so, so we've got nothing at the federal level, we have the state level. Um, and then from there, that drops down to the public school district. Note, note that I'm saying public school. So government, you know, paid for school. Uh, um, we'll get to private schools in a minute. But then 
in, let's say, LAUSD, they allow the site, local site control. So the principal, um, administ you know, the top administrator at the school gets to govern their school culture because they know everybody on the ground best, right? So they have some control over that too. So there may be, if you have an administrator who's very, um, uh, very interested in prevention, very interested in social emotional learning, you may have an administrator who, who puts it right up front. Um, you know, this is a school that believes that everyone belongs. Uh, if we see bullying, here's what we're gonna do. It's gonna be very easy to find the information on bullying right away. And then you'll find schools where that is in the background somewhere. And I, if a school, if I see a school in the news or if a school asks me to come talk, I immediately go to their website and I see how much time it takes for me to find their bullying policy and their bullying prevention, you know, thoughts and ideas. And sometimes I have to dig and dig and dig until I can find anything that actually tells me what bullying is. And that's not just here. And that doesn't really happen so much here in LAUSD, but it does happen everywhere that there are just these vast differences. And if you go to the interior of California, you know how big California is. It's like the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, they can be what feels like 20 years behind where we are on the coast in the big cities. Uh, and their thoughts on bullying and prevention are not current. And things are happening that are bad, that, that you know, bad. And so, so we're not on the same page even in this one state. Um, in terms of, um, then that's just public school. Private school, um, they have a different latitude. They can kind of, I'm not going to say do what they want, because they're still working off of California Department of Education code, but they're not bound by all of the same regulations. It's a little more free for all. And they can also say, hey, we're not renewing your contract or you're out of our school. So their consequences are a little different. Um, so we have all that private school and we have charter schools too that are governed a little differently. Um, they're part of the public school district. You see what I'm you see where I'm going, right? It's a little bit different wherever you go. Now we do have officers, we have law enforcement in the schools. There's discussion right now in LAUSD about whether or not that actually helps. Um, but there is usually one or two, uh, we call them SROs, um, in, uh, in schools, in public schools, and there's security in private schools. I was at a, um, a Jewish day school a year ago that had very private security that was packing very visible weapons. Um, that such is the threat they, they live under. So uh, we have those. Uh, some of them are very well trained to de-escalate situations, but I do find that the impulse towards involving law enforcement is, is becoming more frequent and younger. I've heard of uh, law enforcement being called for students as young as six over, um, you know, if the bu bullying word gets mentioned and then in some places they call law enforcement. And I've had law enforcement say to me, why aren't the schools handling this? Why are we being called in on, on so many of these things? I think we're back to the fact that a lot of adults will go directly to, I'm gonna sue you or harm your reputation if you don't fix this situation fast enough for me. So they just go, just cut out the middle man and go right to the law enforcement. Um, but there is, uh, people are doing research now. Um, we know that for students um, who are in uh, minority populations um, uh, or non-majority populations, that that can be um, calling law enforcement is the school to prison pipeline. You know, that we are already putting a kid on a path that is very very bad that does not help resolve anything for this child. So we're starting to look very carefully at law enforcement in the schools, what that does. There are a lot of really, I've met a lot of really wonderful officers who really want to work with kids that's in their heart. So there are a lot of good folks um, trying to do that work, trying to help. And again, remember the, a lot of the solutions require that the larger community is, is layered into the solution. So I hope you get a sense of the variability of adult response. Uh, we have a way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Well, 
we dare to ask one more question. Sure. This is about uh, uh, this is about the presence of law enforcers. Mm. Is there, by the way, is there any legal liability, like criminal liability, for bullying? Is there any legal uh, liability, criminal liability, for committing bullying in the United States? Or maybe some administrative liability. Um, this is tough. I'm, I'm not, you know, again, that's. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you the like, you know, some of that um, in a more legally uh, appropriate way, perhaps. Um, what what we find is that over eighteen, right, when you become a legal adult here in this country, the consequences for certain behaviors are, you know, that they become criminal, right? So you hit somebody, um, and you can easily be charged with a crime. Um, but when a child is a minor, um, we have a more, uh, I want to say, elastic response. So that sometimes law enforcement will, get, will be involved. Sometimes there will be um, more law, you know, uh, law enforcement involvement, and it will continue. Most often, um, I think everybody hopes that it can be solved you know, as locally as possible. Um, it's that's that's tough. Again, we're back to specific situations. Um, can you cl just clarify the question one more time? If um, uh, to, play, to put it in plain words, uh, can a person uh, can a child be put into prison for committing bullying? Is there any far are there, are there any fines or prison sentences uh, yes okay. uh, imposed on children for committing bullying uh, to other children what is the age of criminal and administrative liability in children if they exercise bullying against others okay so by and large no uh we we don't you know i i do think if there's a pervasive uh you know, a repetition of aggressive acts that are um, of a sufficient severe nature, a child could probably be put in some kind of juvenile detention, but that is not what we want to do, or that's not the will here. That's, the, you know, we, we would try to do every kind of intervention before a child um, is uh, charged, but it varies again, according to demographics. So we know, for instance, that children of color come in for a lot more discipline, a lot more discipline and a lot more uh, legal interaction or a lot more interaction from the law. And so there's something else at work there. By and large, we don't want to do that. I don't know about fines. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I don't hear about that very often. So I'm, unfortunately, I have to give you an anecdotal response. Uh, um, some of our government websites be able to help you with that a little bit more and if you if you if, if you want me to find it um uh, you you can email me and then send we'll send it back out to the group but i know that i know that i well i but i i want to say that i knew, i know that adults really want there to be consequences like that i know that the the parents and families of kids who are targeted would really love to see kids uh, who are bullying be punished that is a drumbeat that never ends and some kind of recourse that they can see. A lot of adults would really like that. Does it help and solve the problem? I don't know. Well, this will not address the problem. This will not solve a problem, of course. Definitely, we can be communicating until dawn because it is already 3 a.m. But, you know, ladies wow. and gentlemen, I am forced to come to the end and uh, to, to call it a day. Uh, thank you very much for your questions and comments. Uh, you see, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, we everyone. ask questions and Judy is answering questions uh, right away. Indeed, we have a very good mood in our chat. I suggest uh, to go to our Telegram chat to continue discussing these matters. Uh, uh, and uh, Judy, if you, uh, if we dare, uh, we we would uh, send you the most interesting questions from uh, our participants. Maybe you could answer. Sure. And and uh, 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 thank you. And uh, now the last question to you. In 
if we speak about preschool institutions, if we speak about children aged uh, up to six or five, mm-hmm. um, do can we qualif- qualify uh, any actions like bullying in this age cohort? If we speak about kindergartens, uh, preschool institutions, by 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 definition, can bullying happen there in this age group in the kindergarten? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question because I feel, I really feel for the children, uh, especially boys who are, are, or any child who's very physical and kinesthetic, you know, as a learner. And they're just, you know, we do see uh, social behaviors that look a lot like bullying behaviors. And I do see that parents and even teachers will throw out the word bully for, you know, three, four year olds. I, I just, it just breaks my heart when I hear that because yeah, we see the behaviors, they look like bullying, but the kids don't really understand um, that what they're doing, they don't understand this idea that they can cause pain in another. Uh, so no, we, yes, we see behaviors, but we don't call them uh, uh, bullying per se. We, 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 we talk, we identify. So I guess the most useful um, strategy or, or best practice would be to make sure that we're identifying these behaviors. We've got our antenna up for kids who seem to only use this behavior in their social interaction. We're watching, and this is the time to teach them there are other things to do with their hands than hit. Uh, but we break it down, you know, for parents and students in a way that can be very, very concrete. I, myself, do not like that word bullying to come into play other than to say, hey, these are the years where they're trying out a whole bunch of things. And it's our job, eyes on all the time, but our job also to redirect. That's almost the best you can do with the preschool edge, right? We redirect, (laughs) we we, we take that energy, we put it into another place. But I would be very wary of of using that bullying word, but I'd be very educational and informative about it with parents. Um, Here's why. Um, here's why. And a lot of forgiveness and a lot of, lot of, you know, um, compassion for kids who only interact with the world in a physical way. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. Thank you so much. Colleagues, uh, there are multiple questions uh, about cyberbullying, and we will definitely come back to them in our next meeting. We will have a standalone meeting on that, uh, on this challenge. And I would like to thank Madam French uh, for your long meeting with us. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for answering thank you. our questions. And maybe you have any message from California, from far away California to our participants on how to turn school in a safe environment without harassment and bullying. Just in one sentence. Uh, Recognizing that it's a longer road, that it's a long-term issue when we talk about prevention and educating people accordingly, that when we make the decision to be intentional about how we how we fashion our communities, that we create communities that have the elements to be healthier, uh, and that we know that we can. I think that's one of the biggest lenses to remove this futility. We can do this work. The intention, our intention, must be long term, right? But we can do this work. I don't, you know, I, I know it's hard. But please know that I am cheering you on from sunny California, where it will be 75 degrees Fahrenheit today. I hate to tell you this, but it's true. Come visit. (laughs) Thank you, Judy. Yes, Yes, of course. And now participants uh, also keep saying it would be nice, nice. Uh, for for our future teachers to be taught at university how to build trustful relations with uh, uh, parents, with children, how to resolve conflicts and how to address bullying. And then this would be a very nice beginning of our long way. Thank you very much, Judy. Distinguished colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, We have been talking for more than two and a half hours in a row. Please let me introduce you (laughs) our tomorrow's agenda. We will have a very hectic agenda. Please look uh, look at it. 
This is what we are going to be doing with you tomorrow. We're going to visit Australia, Brazil, virtually. And we are going to be in the United States again. And I can see that at 13.30, we start a meeting with Brazil. Then we fly to the United States of America and then to Australia, traveling across continents. This is great. Please find uh, uh, this agenda, uh, and uh, here's the Philip Slee, Professor Director of the Research Center for Student Wellbeing and Prevention of Violence from the Linders University from Australia. This is going to be a very interesting uh, experience. I looked at the presentation. Then, of course, uh, we will listen to Brazil. Uh, we are flying to a sunny country, Brazilian approach to prevent uh bullying i think this is a very interesting uh, agenda a look at it and uh, social emotional learning is a fundamental to combat bullying uh we will listen to the u.s presenter uh from uh, th this will be the ch chief programs officer uh, from the responsive classroom center for responsive schools and uh, join us and um uh, and uh, write us your feedbacks uh, with the description of your anti-bullying programs in your schools and educational institutions. Please contact our chat board where you will get uh, personalized information and you will get answers to all technical issues. I would like to wish you a very good uh, evening. Have a good night. And we will have a fruitful day today. So uh, we will... Uh, Start at 18.30 Astana time. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye.